Welcome to the Bloomberg Green Festival. I'm Carol Masser in Seattle, where we are hosting an amazing lineup of leaders from business, government, and climate innovators across a four-day event. On the agenda, topics including the climate economy, innovation, and green policy. And it's not just all talk. Let's take a look. There's a lot of rhetoric out there that makes you want to believe that we humans are destroying the planet. That's not true. We are the most creative opportunity for the Earth. So instead of minimizing your uh, footprint, maximize your handprint. Activists are here to help everybody push the boundaries of our imagination. We should not live from the Earth. We should live with the Earth. This work that all of you are doing, by the way, uh, we're not going to have this work done in our lifetime, so we're fighting for something beyond our meager and short-lived existence on Earth. That's a noble thing. We do not intend to surrender to a pollution blanket that allows the special interests to rip us off uh, and then burn us up. This is a health issue. It is not just the polar bears. It is our children. This is a battle that we can't lose. For me, it's science. That's our hope. That's, that's our hope, is science, empirical data. Hello, Bloomberg. The incredible investment that comes from the Inflation Reduction Act is that it shifts the conversation from one of can I afford it to how do I get it. These are things that can be unwound in a second Trump presidency. I am terrified about the system coming unraveled. We're going to tackle a challenge as large as climate change. We have to partner together. That's what's happening around the Seattle Center ground and on the stage in McCaw Hall. Let's start there. I mean, I've been doing this work for almost 30 years, and I, I think it's important to remain curious and not become entrenched in what you think you know. And that not only allows you to approach the challenges in new ways, also to see what you're missing, but it keeps it interesting, right? It, it keeps it fresh and uh, fun and curious. And as a creative storyteller, I'm always looking for new ways of communicating with the world about our, our challenges ahead and inspire people. And if you're just telling the same old stories, um, you may get stuck in, um, in, in a false narrative just because it sounds good or because it sold last year. Uh, so I feel like I'm you know, in my 20th act, really, and I'm always constantly looking to make the work interesting and tap into new aspects of my own inspiration to approach the problem and, and keep going. You know, we, we, need, uh, we need our lifetime, lifelong commitment to this work. It's a lifestyle, after all. And so we've got to make sure that it, we don't get burnt out. I understand now you've gotten very into, you're deeply committed to oceans, and you've gotten very committed to regenerative agriculture. So can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that and sort of what, why you see that as critical to the climate yeah. fight? Well, I have a philosophy. I practice this thing which I'm sort of creating called oscillation. Um, uh, you, you, you have to oscillate between the very big, the macro, and the, and the very small. Uh, you can't get lost in the, you know, the, the, the big problems of the world and get overwhelmed by them because then you won't take action. And so after 20 plus years doing environmental work, trying to, you know, work on the world's problems, uh, you know, business solutions, hearts and minds, uh, UN legislation, I, I needed to come small and very personal. And that's when um, I decided to start doing something that was extremely close to home and, um, and part of my family. So I started to 
uh, work on re regenerative agriculture because I wanted to know where my food was coming from. And I didn't want to cede responsibility to someone else or wag my finger at Whole Foods for not like doing it right or something like that. And I wanted to know directly where my food is coming from. And I realized that I can actually solve a lot of problems just on an individual localized, hyper-localized level by taking care of a small piece of land that I have complete purview over and I can make sure that it's, it's done to the way that I think needs, you know, how I, I can actually steward that piece of land. As somebody who's been so committed to the storytelling elements of activism, how do you, what have you learned about how you make those connections from the super personal to the global nature of the problem, whether it's on oceans or regenerative ag or things you learn through Lonely Whale or other things? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do believe that the future is decentralized. You know, and um, this top-down wagging your finger, soapboxing, telling people how to be, who to be, I think, you know, served its role. But I think we're going to be far more effective when people start to recognize that they want to take responsibility and that they're empowered to make changes where they are. And they're going to have an understanding of what's needed locally that someone in an office or in, someone in a high tower couldn't possibly understand. Adrian Grenier inspiring the Bloomberg Green Festival participants in Seattle. They also heard from a climate activist whose message starts where she did at home in Mexico. I come from an indigenous community in central Mexico called Otomi Toltec, and we have a lot of values around respect for nature, reciprocity, uh, res um, reverence, intergenerational collaboration, and seeing nature as an extension of us and us as an extension of nature. I always love sharing this detail about my language, which is that the word for skin is the same as the word for the outer layer of the earth. So embedded in our culture is the notion that we are extensions of the earth, and we have not been behaving in that way. Um, you know, imagine a world where category five hurricanes um, grow in two, over two days. Imagine a world where we are at 1.64 degrees of warming for 12 consecutive months where our unifying story is a flood or a hurricane or a wildfire, and where over a billion animals can die in one single wildfire. And now imagine that there are children that have not, not, known nothing but that world, and I am one of those children, one of those youth today. Uh, for many people um, in the climate space that have been in the climate space for decades, they know that, you know, they knew how bad it was gonna get, but we, as youth climate activists, know nothing else. My generation is here today because we have no other choice. And we really want to make sure that when we talk about activism, which is a very mystified term, what does it mean to be an activist? What does it mean to speak up? I think it means to be creative. Because creativity is looking at something and seeing how it can be more beautiful, how it can work better, how it can be more effective, or. In this case, how can we work towards balance with Mother Earth? But today we are in a case where many people from my generation are either totally ignoring the climate crisis and focusing on daily trends over consumption or, tr or so embedded in it that we cannot think of anything else. And I think the path forward is some of the stuff that I'm going to be sharing today, which is about how do we work together intergenerationally so that we are not saying things like adults told our future. We're saying we have a problem now. How can we fix it together? I think I'm curious, sort of a twofold question. Why is it so important to have youth activists in this space? But also, do you feel like sometimes there's like a little bit of lip service being paid to like not actually listening to the things that you guys are saying? I mean, it's easy to not listen to the things that we're saying, because the things that we're saying entail changing full systems, and we are comfortable in the systems that we have created. Um, and when you have a perspective that is trying to tell you, let's stop, let's change, I understand how difficult that can be, because I can feel it you know, in my own nonprofit when somebody else has an idea, you think of everything that needs to happen for it to become a reality. And so I understand why it can feel that youth activists can be naive at times at saying, we need to be net zero by this date. We need to this, this, and this. Um, and there's this concept that we don't understand the real world, whatever that means, which I think, you know, it's everybody's own perception. 
Um, but I think that the naiveness is looking at the level of our crisis and thinking that we can go on any longer. My question for the leaders out there, not only the corporate leaders, but you know, also government leaders is, is it not necessary to be uncomfortable, to change our minds, to see the problems, to be empathetic to the way that youth are feeling across the world? And that's why I think that every single company, no matter who you are, needs to have youth advisors, and not just one or two, because it's harder to stand up when you're just yourself. We need to have a true cohorts, true inclusion, true implementation, because at the end of the day, we want youth to be able to shape the world because we want to live in it. We want our kids to live in it. We want it to be healthy and safe. In indigenous communities, there's the concept of good living, of good enough, of not better, but good. And so we have to question ourselves. How do we tell stories of good? What is good? When do we need no more? And how can the economic system adapt to no more? How can we see value in nature? Why is nature more valuable when it's dead than when it's alive? All of these questions we have to think through because they might be uncomfortable, they might mess up the economic systems in the ways that we know it, but the earth cannot handle it anymore. Coming up, more from the Bloomberg Green Festival in Seattle. And by the way, I want to welcome everybody in the state of Washington, the most innovative state and the most beautiful country and, and the most wonderful planet in the solar system. So welcome. You are in the right place. <laughs> Welcome back, I'm Carol Masser. Governor Jay Inslee has seen the evolution of climate change and how the government can make an impact. He spoke at the Bloomberg Green Festival with Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton. And because we recognize the incredible state we have, we do not intend to lose her. We do not intend to surrender to a pollution blanket that allows the special interests to rip us off and then burn us up. And so we have an incredible tool against that pollution blanket, which is the Climate Commitment Act. This act reduces pollution. It limits pollution. And by the way, we don't say this enough. Climate change means pollution, and people do not like pollution. I was wondering how we make combating climate change and you know, making this a priority the biggest tent possible to bring in people of different political persuasions, different ideologies, and make sure that everyone feels like there's a place for them in this fight. Well, the good news is the vast majority of Washingtonians understand climate science. Mm -hmm. They're not like uh, the mega person that denies it and calls it a hoax and says that wind turbines cause cancer. That is a minority position. Vast majority of Washingtonians understand the scientific principles behind climate change. And the, the way we do this is that folks are now experiencing this in their own lives. You know, 10, 15 years ago, climate change was a graph. It was CO2 parts per million. Now it is the fact that your child can't go outside in August, and this is a reality, two of the last four years. Our kids couldn't go outside because of the smoke they're choking on from the fires in Canada and from our own forests. We felt that in Washington, D.C. last year. Washington, D.C. Yeah. They're now experiencing the tremendous heat. They're seeing salmon runs decline, that they can't go uh, fishing. They are now experiencing this in a real world. So people are demanding, and we should respond to give them solutions to this, this problem. Now, the other thing is, and I'm going to talk about the moral aspect of this, but the economic aspect, too, they are now experiencing the benefits of this economically. They're getting heat pumps. They're getting help for, uh, uh, for uh, electric school buses. They're getting help for air filtration systems at our schools. They're getting all of this assistance, and they're getting jobs. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest job-creating opportunity we have. I can't throw a rock without hitting a clean energy company and the jobs that have been created. So they have a take-home, where you take home pay associated with this mm -hmm. uh, innovation. And the innovation in our state is, is really leading the nation, frankly, and the mm -hmm. things we're doing. The advanced battery manufacturing two plants, most advanced silicon anode batteries in the world are in Moses Lake, Washington. Uh, we're making aerospace fuel out of carbon dioxide and, 
and water in Moses Lake, Washington at the 12 company, you just can't overstate the amount of job creation that's going on. So this is a pocketbook uh, issue with folks. But when you, when you ask, you know, how are we going to get folks to buy into this? Because basically we all share something, which is a sense of morality. This is a moral issue. It is not just an economic one. It is a moral issue because it is a commitment to our children. And mm -hmm. everybody shares that regardless in some deep way to want to take care of their kids. And I believe we need to talk this more, that this is a moral cause, not just an economic one. And the kids not, get it. <laughs> the kids certainly get it. Well, I'll tell you, you go to a seventh grade class and you ask them who believes there's climate change and, you know, 95% of the hands go up and who believes we should do something about it and 96% go up. But we live in the most consequential moment of human history because our ability to tame climate change is the one that will, will set the course for millennia. And we have to win this. And the reason I say this is that, you know, with all of our frustrations about this issue, it's a great time to be alive because we have something that we can do that's, that's very meaningful and we can win this. And by the way, there's a reason for optimism. Look, we've increased our solar by 400% in the last five years, a wind by 45%. The price of solar energy has come down 90%. The day before yesterday, I went to two fusion companies which have promised that might give us fusion energy coming right out of Washington State, zero, you know, zero waste, infinite <laughs> energy. So there is cause for optimism on this. We are accelerating our progress dramatically. It's just that we got to pick up the pace. Mm -hmm. So what we need to know is, is that we're capable of doing these things. It's just we need to do them faster. Also on the Green State, Stacey Abrams. She may be best known for her voting rights work, but in Seattle, she talked about rewiring America with Bloomberg's Akshat Rati. What are the biggest barriers that you still see are remaining in trying to get people to recognize that electrifying their lives is beneficial to them even before it is beneficial to the planet? I think the challenge is not convincing people it's beneficial, it's convincing people it's accessible. Uh, because for the low-income, moderate-income families that are facing this challenge, they hear the specter of climate action, but they often see the behavior of people who are wealthier, who can afford to make choices. And so often it feels like sacrifice. It doesn't feel like progress. And I think the important piece of the work rewiring has done, the incredible investment that comes from the Inflation Reduction Act, is that it shifts the conversation from one of, can I afford it, to how do I get it? Uh, when people get to make decisions that benefit their lives, they are much more likely to do so. We, we like getting stuff. Uh, and people like being cooler in the summer, they like being warmer in the winter, they like their power bills going down. And what we have to do is actually create the space for them to understand that's doable for the first time. But I grew up in Southern Mississippi. I grew up near uh, Cancer Alley in Louisiana. I grew up in petrochemical corridors where communities were often not served and where it seemed impossible for progress to happen. I lived in a community in college where the juxtaposition of where I went to school and where my older sister went to school was very distinct. And so a large part of this is just letting people know what's available, what's possible, and that they can afford it. In DeSoto, Georgia, we're actually making certain that every household that wants something is getting the investment of an upgraded appliance. We have a woman who was living without running water in her home because she couldn't afford to upgrade her water heater. It had rusted out and she just, she's an elderly woman, Mildred Carter, 75, and was just going across the street to her neighbor's house to get water. Because of the monies that are gonna come in, because of the work of rewiring, she got a new water heater. There was a family that was living in a double wide trailer without central air with kids, I mean, three generations of families. They now have central air for the first time in their lives. Just to connect the dots here, the reason why this is very important to our political future and very important to our climate future is that electrification and making these decisions is anti-inflationary to people's day-to-day -day lives because they trade out a $500 bill for a $100 bill. 
but it's also anti-inflationary because the most inflationary force in the history of humankind is climate change. Ari Matusiak alongside Stacey Abrams. Up next, the story of one climate refugee told in a very unique way. Welcome back, I'm Carol Masser. A well-told story can shape public opinion. A powerful film can create lasting impressions. At the Bloomberg Green Festival in Seattle, the Bloomberg Green Docs competition featured several important films and one winner. During the event, five documentaries, the finalists, were screened. They explored topics ranging from saving melting glaciers. I have a very important feeling when I'm here on the glacier. I want to be a part of the solution and not of the problem. To protecting old growth forests. <laughs> it's on <all> my heart. <laughs> to the importance of species protection. Caring for them gives us all enormous pleasure. They're the most wonderful, wonderful animals. This year's winner is Finding Home, an animated documentary that features the story of a young mother in Brazil forced by drought and disease to leave her family's home. Antônia Jardena da Silva, eu sou de Milhã, é um município, 15 mil habitantes, mais ou menos. A maioria das vezes é um clima bastante quente, muito quente. Meu pai trabalhava na roça, ele começou a plantar quando começou a chover. Agora que não está chovendo, ele deu uma parada. I guess I'm curious when uh, people watch these films and begin to think more about the future climate migrant problem, is there something you hope in terms of policies or preparations to bring about as a, as a change? Uh, yeah, I'm hoping that um, climate, will, uh, climate refugees will receive uh, a, a status because so far they don't have one that's universally recognized. And um, I'm hoping that we can somehow battle this political talk of, you know, go back to where you came from because for some people there is no place to go back to. So we need to think as a community and society of how we, we, we deal with that. It, it's a massive issue that's not going to disappear for sure. The winner of the Bloomberg Green Docs competition. Coming up, finding investing opportunities in climate change. You cannot be a tourist in climate. Mm. You can't just sort of pop in and think you know the answer. This is an immensely complicated revolution that we're going through. I don't think I have to tell this room because you're here, but we have to encourage people to do the work and not simply fall back on how things are done now. The Bloomberg Green Festival is in Seattle because of the city's impressive legacy of environmental leadership. This city has focused on building a clean energy economy and in investing in healthy, well-connected communities.
Let's get inside to the main event stage. Bloomberg's Jason Kelly with TPG Executive Chairman Jim Coulter. We're about to undertake a $120 trillion reindustrialization of the world. And that need and that opportunity need to move together. The money can't come from governments. No coalition of NGOs can get it done. Unless we can get the money moving in a capitalist system, we can't solve the problem. So this idea of putting the need and the opportunity together mm -hmm. has been more challenging than I expected. One thing I know from 40 years in business is nothing is linear, and there will be surprises. In fact, we should assume that there's going to be discontinuity. More people died from infections than heart attacks right. before penicillin. You know, Taxis were taxis before Uber. Trading was trading until, uh, until um, uh, indexing. So industries constantly go through disruptions. As I travel the climate world, I'm running into disruptions that are about to happen at any time. I can't yet tell you which will happen, mm. but I would bet on the field. There are going to be discontinuities that break our way. Our goal is to position for them. The second thing I'd point out in the green shoot side is understand the power of cost curves. Think about cell phones. In about 2000, they hit a whole new level and suddenly they were ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. It changed how video conferencing came out in 1964, but it was $5,300 an hour. When it's free, things work very differently. In the climate world, you are watching some of the most powerful industrial cost curves I've ever seen. 28% for solar, that is double a normal industry. And these cost curves, while they look linear, they hit points like right about now when solar becomes dramatically cheaper, mm -hmm. things happen. We can predict the cost curves, we can't predict how the market change. So then why, the, why that word cloud of pessimism? Well, I think in some ways, the voices that got us to this key moment have been calling out the need. And part of the reason I'm on the stage, I don't do many conferences, is we need to change our voices a little. We need to also make sure that we're looking for that opportunity. And we're looking for the, for the you know, there, Colin Powell once said about leadership is that uh, optimism is a force multiplier. Mm. We have to find a little bit of optimism. That is not to deny that this is tough. And the last thing on optimism is, you know, when things like this conference happen where you get many parts of, of society, policy members, act, um, activists working together, things happen. Yeah. Anyone remember the population bomb? 30 printings back in 1968. We were going to be out of food. I, Los Angeles, the smog was awful. I was in Beijing three weeks ago. The skies were clear. The ozone layer is actually going the other way now. now with time and with action, I think we can make progress. And that green shoots are something we need to grab a hold of. All right, so I'm gonna go counter then for my next, <laughs> for, for my next question, which is the whataboutisms. Yeah, we also, as well as some optimism, we have to basically not fall for whataboutism. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of the interesting things that's happened, if you look online and at social media, the attacks of climate deniers have flattened, but the attacks on climate solutions have gone up. And these are whataboutisms. Now, whataboutisms is a term that came um, from the 70s with the Irish Republican Army. Whenever they would do something, they'd say, what about the, what about the uh, British soldiers? And Soviet propaganda uses whataboutisms. When Chernobyl hits, it's what about Three Mile Island? So my point here is, um, as we're going down this path, we have to make sure that we don't get caught in the whataboutisms. And I always say, like, you know, what about doing the work? Yeah. And what about solving the problem? You have to understand what we're doing is a simplification problem. I want you to think about our current energy system. You want to turn on a light. How does that work? Well, first of all, 50 million years ago, the sun shines. It's captured in a tree. The tree falls down. For 50 million years, it gets subsumed under thousands of feet. We then take an iron pipe. We put it down 10,000 feet. We turn it right. We put in water. We crack rock. We bring up a vapor. The vapor goes in 3 million miles of pipe. We wash it in a $250 million natural gas processing plant. We put it in 3 million miles of pipe again. We put it to a billion dollar uh, gas turbine. We basically blow it up, releasing a, a molecule that can destroy the world, and we have an electron. The other way to do that <laughs> is we can get sun from this afternoon, hit a silicon panel. There's silicon everywhere, and we have an electron. Yeah. So it seems hard to do. <laughs> 
I mean, it, it's, see, we have, this is hard to do, but what we're doing is hard. Yeah. So like, why not make it a little more simple? Given everything that you've just told us, what does this room do? I think importantly, we need to take a bias to action and a touch of optimism. So one of the things that happens in a relay race is the last leg is sometimes the fastest. And what surprised people historically is when you look at the time, I mean, after 30 years of the atomic revolution, Oppenheimer stepped in and won a war, won seven Oscars, right? It's like, it's, it, <laughs> so so I, I think there's an optimism here that we can get this moving. There, we may not be moving fast enough, but we are moving faster. And the path to progress is in perfection starts with progress. Right. And uh, I, I see that I think that's happening and the passing of the baton will accelerate it. So let's have some hope. TPG Executive Chairman Jim Coulter. Also on the green stage, a business leader whose career focus has been helping to preserve the environment. Businesses don't hate regulations. They hate uncertainty. That is the, the killer of business. If I'm making an investment that is going to last for 50 years or 30 years, I want to make sure that I'm going to be able to get a return on that investment and the rules aren't going to change. And, you know, I worked in the oil industry early in my career. I, I worked as a banker with many companies in the natural resource sector. I'm on the boards of companies now. And they don't mind playing by the rules. They can't have rules that keep changing back and forth. And I'll give you a good example. We worked really hard with governors and wildlife agencies from 11 western states, seven core states, on the protection of habitat uh, called the Sagebrush Sea. And um, Republican, Democrat, uh, Republican governors, Democratic governors, administrations uh, from all political stripes working together to say, how do we do this? Because the governors did not want to lose control of their ability to develop, okay? Um, because of their hard work to protect these landscapes, the Fish and Wildlife Service said, this species does not need to be listed as endangered, okay? When that happened, the oil companies and everything heaved a sigh of relief because they had the rule book and they knew where they could develop or put transmission lines in or other things. They knew what they had to do and the areas they had to avoid. When Trump came into office and Ryan Zinke was in his brief tenure in the position that I used to hold, he said he was gonna undo those rules. The very Republican governor of Wyoming, Matt Mead, who worked hard with us on this, went to the Trump administration and said, please don't. The oil companies are coming to me saying, oh no, don't reopen this, we have a deal. And uh, the Trump administration tried to undermine, undermine it anyway. They, they had, had not been successful, at least at that point, but the oil companies are coming to the Republican governor saying, no, 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 we had a deal. We knew the rule book. And that's, that's a good illustration. So businesses hate chaos. They need predictability. Former Interior Secretary Sally Jewell. Up next, the man who has done more for electric cars around the world than Elon Musk. Festival shared the stage with TED Talks in Seattle. Let's join Bloomberg senior reporter Akshat Roddy. I was at a climate protest and I saw a poster that said in big letters, burn capitalism, not coal. Now, how many of you agree that to tackle climate change, we should stop burning coal? Raise your hands. Almost all of you. And how many of you agree that to tackle climate change, we should burn capitalism? There are a few hands, but not as many. I'm a journalist and I write about climate solutions. And when I ask this question of people, I get the full range of answers from those who say that the system that got us into this mess can never get us out of it, to those who say that the only answer is to unleash market forces for the innovations we need. But who is right? I wanted to find the answer for myself. 
So I started on the rooftop of my childhood home in India. I wanted to get solar panels for my parents. It took two days to get quotes, two weeks to have those shiny devices up on the roof, ready to capture the sun's energy. The payback was quick. Electricity bills fell, and my parents have recovered the investment in five years. For the next 15 years, they can enjoy solar power for free. So what has capitalism got to do with it? Well, India did not invent the technologies that go into solar panels. Even today, India manufactures only a small fraction of what it deploys. And yet, a country with less than $3,000 of income per person per year is able to benefit from what is now one of the world's cheapest sources of energy. This has happened because profit-seeking companies want to sell all of us more and more solar panels. But it has happened because governments created that market through subsidies and regulations. Now, the primary motivation to deploy these solutions does not have to be tackling climate change. Other pressing issues, such as air pollution, or energy security, or global competitiveness, can garner even more support. How exactly? Let me tell you the story of Wan Gang. You've probably never heard of him, but he has done more for the global rise of electric cars than Elon Musk. Wan was born in China. He trained as an auto engineer before moving to Germany and working for Audi. There he saw the lifestyle that Germans lived and realized that perhaps Chinese people may never be able to experience it. That's because in 2000, China burned about one barrel of oil per person per year. Germans burned 12 times as much. So he made the case to the Chinese leadership that the country needed to work on an alternative and that he was willing to lead the charge. So he was given a chance to work on a government program. Wan's team, in a period of eight years, built hundreds of electric cars and buses that were used at the Beijing Olympics. In those same eight years, the country's oil bill ballooned and its cities became globally infamous for air pollution. But Wan had shown that an alternative could work. If China could scale the manufacturing of electric cars, air pollution would be cut, oil imports would be cut, and most importantly, China would create a new industry that could compete with other countries. So Wan was made the science minister, and the government started giving out tens of billions of dollars in subsidies for the manufacturing of electric cars and lithium-ion batteries. The government also started putting regulations to make it harder to buy fossil fuel cars. Even today, if you're in Shanghai and you want to buy a gasoline-powered car, you have to enter a lottery and win it. If you want an electric car, you can just go to a showroom and buy one. The Chinese government provided direction, but it was the practitioners of capitalism that made a small electric car industry into the global giant that it is today. One of those investors was Warren Buffett. He invested in a little-known company then called BYD. Today, BYD sells more electric cars than Tesla. For climate capitalism to work, governments and businesses need to be flexible. They need to recognize when there are policies that require certainty, but if they're not working, then they must be changed. Governments need to work with business to figure out what are the regulations that would work. That's Akshat Radi. We also heard from a campaign voting guru on how to get candidates to prioritize long-term climate issues. Here's Nathaniel Stinnett. I've worked in politics for over 20 years. And one of the biggest barriers we face when addressing the climate crisis is a lack of political will to enact all the climate solutions that we already have. Whether it's energy permitting, pollution regulation, tax codes, building codes, you name it. The reason so little is getting done is often because it's easier to win elections by ignoring the climate crisis rather than addressing it. The problem is this. 
we don't have enough climate voters in the United States. And that's largely because millions of environmentalists don't bother to vote. When we look back at exit polling data from the 2020 presidential election, ultimately only 4% of voters listed climate change as their top priority. 22 midterm polls showed the same thing, 4%. And when so few voters prioritize climate change, two really important things start happening. First, it becomes incredibly hard to elect climate leaders. But second, even when climate leaders do win elections, it isn't like they can then just snap their fingers and get everything they want done. No, they still need to pick and choose what to spend their political capital on, and they ain't gonna spend it on the thing that only 4% of voters list as a top priority. And here's the final reason why this, this lack of voter demand for climate leadership is so problematic. Politicians know whether you vote or not. That's right. Who you vote for is secret. But whether you vote or not, in the United States, that's public record. And with limited time and limited money, the most important decision any political campaign makes is who to talk to and who to ignore. And when you literally have public voter files that tell you by name and street address which people have a history of voting in the election you're trying to win, well, who do you think political campaigns talk to? Likely voters. And who do you think they poll to figure out what issues to prioritize? Likely voters. All the TED Talks from Seattle will be released soon on TED's own website at TED.com. Coming up, more from the Bloomberg Green Festival in Seattle. So how do you think about what you guys need to do at Amazon in terms of the next generation? Yeah, I think increasingly this next generation, they both care a lot, they're incredibly passionate, and they have a lot of anxiety um, about what's coming and what the state of the world is. Masser. As you've seen, the Bloomberg Green Festival brought together innovators, policymakers, and activists. I got the chance to speak with two leaders with very different backgrounds who have shared goals. Here's WNBA legend Sue Bird and Amazon's Kara Hurst. We want to send these really strong demand signals, um, and we want to also put our own resources towards that. So we've been doing things like purchasing renewable energy. We're the largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy in the world. We have been for the last four years. We announced yesterday we've actually hit 100% renewable energy across our global operations, um, which is a huge feat. We have over 500 projects. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, around the world. Um, we've got 24,000 electric delivery vehicles on the road already. We've got one of the world's largest charging, uh, electric charging uh, infrastructure kind of operations going. We've just got, you know, we look at all the different aspects of our operations um, and think about how do we make it more sustainable on behalf of our customer. We want to reduce waste. We took out those plastic air pillows. We took out 95% of those in North America. So we're, we want to make a sustainable company and do it on behalf of our customer. Sue, so I want to bring you into it. You are part of a group of very elite athletes. Mm -hmm. And when we use the word legendary, it doesn't apply to everybody, but it definitely applies to you. So kudos. <laughs> um, that platform, though, has been a couple of decades in the making and then some. How do you think about your platform and the responsibility of how you use it? Yeah, um, women's sports is at an interesting moment, you know, especially women's basketball. And for a good you know, interesting, right? Yeah, no, great interesting. <laughs> great interesting. But what's interesting about it, maybe in a negative sense, is while the coverage has increased, what I've noticed is it's not always accurate. Mm -hmm. And it's really had me take a step back and be like, first of all, what else is inaccurate out there being told to us, you know, by trusted 
you know, places, um, trusted, other trusted platforms. Um, so I think for me, when it comes to my platform, for so long while I was playing, it was about, you know, bring a certain understanding to the game, right? Using my platform for, for all kinds of good. Now I'm like, wait a minute, I gotta make sure the stories that are being told are accurate. I gotta make sure that when people are tuning into a game, they have a full understanding. So that's really where I feel like I can use my platform now as a retired player. I wanna talk a little bit about the Climate Pledge. So I'm curious, Kara, when you have conversations with companies, um, what is it, is it tough to get them to sign on or tell us kind of the environment here. Yeah, I think it, it's a huge commitment to sign on, um, and it certainly takes resources. And so I think it takes a leap of faith, too. Not, not all of us know how we're going to get there. There are some things we know how to do, like electrifying fleet. And then there are other things, like aviation, where we know sustainable aviation feels part of it, but we don't know all of the solves. Um, and so some of it is a, a bit of jumping into the fray and saying, we know some of how we're going to get there. And, and also, we need to partner to figure out some of the other ways, which we don't necessarily know. Um, and we need to change the game, right? <laughs> so we need to figure out um, how we're going to come together and make new decisions together, put resources together. And also, public-private partnerships are a big part of it. So how do we come together and work in the cities where we all have employees or we have operations and get cities to change their infrastructure? Mm -hmm. you know, and build differently the buildings that we're in or put more rail in or change our, you know, the ways in which people commute and those kind of things as well. Well, how do you think about what you guys need to do at Amazon in terms of the next generation? Yeah, I think increasingly this next generation, they both care a lot, they're incredibly passionate, and they have a lot of anxiety um, about what's coming and what the state of the world is. And so one of the things um, I think is our responsibility is one, to act fast, um, to drive big solutions, but also to bring some optimism to it. We have time. Um, we don't have a lot of time. We're in this decisive decade where we have to act now. Right. Um, we have to move very quickly. And so I think one of the things that we need to lead on is to show that there, is, there are solutions, but we need to deploy them now. Um, we cannot wait any longer. Amazon's Kara Hurst. That's it from the Bloomberg Green Festival in Seattle. Whether you run a business or a household, lead a nonprofit, or work with your community group, you can find stories that matter to you at Bloomberg.com. I'm Carol Nasser.